everyone. Welcome to our today's session entitled Liver Disease and Treatments. We are glad to have with us Dr. Hashem Siraj, internal and gastroenterology doctor, uh, chair, professor, and director of Digestive Disease Medical Center at Baylor St. Luke. Uh, doctor, we know that, uh, that there are uh, more than 100 different uh, liver diseases, but today we are going to uh, focus uh, about the most common, uh, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and fatty liver disease uh, due to alcoholic uh, abuse. Uh, first, doctor, before uh, starting with the diseases, can you tell us uh, uh, the importance of the liver uh, in the human body and what is its main function? Sure, thank you very much, and it's good to be with you here. Uh, so the liver is, is a very important vital organ, meaning people cannot live without a liver, or at least a functioning liver. Uh, it has several functions, uh, but the main ones, uh, main ones are manufacturing uh, the main ingredients for survival, uh, fats, uh, carbohydrates, uh, things like that. The other main function is removal of the toxins in the liver, both the tox of, of the body, the, the toxins that we ingest and the toxins that are uh, produced. Um, the, the third function is uh, regulation of the digestion uh, of the food. For example, it manufactures a substance called bile. That's the yellowish substance that gives the food and the stool its color. And without it, uh, people cannot digest fat. Uh, so uh, these are just uh, the main functions, but but the important part is uh, a, a healthy liver is essential uh, for life. For example, you can remove your appendix, you can remove your gallbladder, you can remove your spleen, you can remove one of your kidneys or even one of your lungs, uh, but you cannot remove your liver and survive. Mm -hmm. So uh, because uh, many people uh, don't know the importance of the liver uh, in the human body, we, we know about the heart, mainly the, the lungs, but the liver, we don't talk about it much. So this is the, the main purpose of our uh, interview today. So doctor, can you tell us the main causes of uh, liver uh, damage? Uh, yes, there, there are many, many causes of liver damage, but let's talk about the uh, important chronic ones. Chronic ones meaning uh, they stay for a long time, they cause damage over time, and uh, the main ones are infections with hepatitis. Uh, they're the main two types of hepatitis that cause chronic infections are hepatitis B, for which now, fortunately, there's a vaccine, and then there's hepatitis C, for which now there's fortunately a very effective treatment. Uh, the third main cause is alcoholic liver disease. That is disease caused by heavy alcohol consumption. And perhaps uh, later on, you and I can define what is the meaning of heavy alcohol consumption. And then what has become now the most common reason worldwide for chronic liver disease is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, for your audience who are up on terminology, uh, it has acquired a new name now, uh, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, mazzled as opposed to NAFLD. Uh, but I think for ease of discussion, let's keep calling yeah. it NAFLD <laughs> or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay, great. And uh, doctor, uh, is there a way of slowing down uh, uh, or stop a liver damage, for example, after uh, getting hepatitis uh, B or C, for example. Yes, so uh, the liver has some capacity, uh, important capacity to mm. regenerate itself, to heal itself. But that capacity gets to a point where it's overwhelmed and instead of healing itself normally, it starts healing itself with forming scar tissue. Scar is like when you scratch your hand and you form a scar. Imagine if you scar your hand every day for 10 years, your ability of your body to form a nice scar evaporates and you become putting down haphazard scar tissue leading to a condition called cirrhosis. So going back to your question, yes, if the original offending problem like hepatitis C is removed in time, the liver yeah. has a tremendous capability 
of reversing the damage. If the alcohol drinking is stopped before permanent damage results, the liver can heal itself. And as we will talk later, if people lose weight or use the appropriate medications, then the ability to reverse the damage from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is there. So uh, it's an important point that the damage to the liver doesn't have to be irreversible, that the liver can regenerate itself. Another important thing that the liver is a resilient organ. You can lose a lot of the function of the liver. And that's really why it's resilient and it's scary without you having any symptoms. So you can lose 80% of the function of your liver and you thinking things are fine because I feel fine. But mm -hmm. then it, suddenly you start not feeling fine. And at that point in time, that means 80 to 90% of your liver is already damaged. And I think that's what your questions hopefully today are important yeah. because the condition that we will talk about is essentially asymptomatic. You have no symptoms until your liver fails. So pe people don't have any signs before uh, having liver damage. So uh, for, for fatty liver that, disease, that, for example, they don't have any, any symptoms. Okay, so are there any tests uh, people should do uh, on a regular basis to, to prevent uh, liver damage, for example? Because as uh, you are saying, 80 we will be losing 80% of our liver function yes. without knowing. Yes. So, so there, there are a few things that are recommended for everyone. It is recommended, uh, at least in this country, in the US, but in many countries around the world, that every adult would have a one-time testing for hepatitis C. That's the hepatitis C. Okay. It is recommended that most people that live in high-risk areas for hepatitis B, that they would have a one-time testing for hepatitis B. Number three, for adults, when they start getting to the age of receiving annual checkups, there is a blood test called liver functions that would give you an idea if there is liver inflammation or not. For fatty liver disease, uh, I'm going to answer more in, in the next questions. It's more complicated than that because the liver functions is a good screener, but it's not enough. People have to consider the other conditions that are present and do more testing. So it's not something that you would detect readily in a primary care visit. So let me repeat, hepatitis C testing, hepatitis B testing, liver function test, and considerations for the people at high risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So doctor, can you tell us what is the difference between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, fatty liver disease due, due to alcohol abuse. Uh, yes, yes. So the liver normally, for those of you who are fond of eating liver, and I know in Lebanon people eat uh, liver yeah. and call it, and call it what? <laughs> and call it sauda, as if you sauda, remember. Yeah. True. Because it has little fat in it. It's mostly blood and myoglobin. So in fatty liver disease, the sauda is no longer sauda. It becomes more of a brownish, lightish color because okay. it has fat in it. So a fatty liver disease is defined as a liver that more than 5% of its weight is fat. There are two main reasons for that. One is alcohol, heavy, and one, what we call the metabolic syndrome, which is obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. So that's what a fatty liver disease is. How is it detected normally? It's detected with an ultrasound or an ultrasound-like test. If you see a fatty liver on an ultrasound or a test like a CT or MRI, you have no idea by just looking at the liver what the cause of the liver of the fatty liver disease it could be alcohol or non-alcohol. So it's important to ask people further about what they're doing in terms of drinking mm -hmm. or no drinking. If mm -hmm. you take a sample of the liver, there are some distinguishing features between the fatty liver related to alcohol and the fatty liver related to non-alcohol. 
But fatty liver, uh, I mean, liver biopsy is no longer really a test that is commonly employed in clinical practice. So we rely on ultrasound um, and a test that I will mention now, which is called FibroScan, and then asking people about the risk factors to distinguish between alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In many people, I should say, the two conditions coexist. Uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease now is present in a full quarter of all adults worldwide. Okay. Fatty liver disease is present in 5% of all adults worldwide. So you can imagine the two actually coexist in many people. And it, sometimes it's not clean whether this is alcohol or non-alcohol. You call it both fatty liver disease. Hmm. So you mean the non-alcohol uh, fatty liver disease is due to uh, lifestyle and uh, obesity maybe and uh, some other uh, like chronic diseases like uh, high blood pressure and diabetes. That's so, right. So uh, I think I think you're you're generally right. There are mm -hmm. lifestyle factors. Uh, yeah. There are also genetic factors to it. Okay. Uh, by the lifestyle, the main risk factors. Um, so I'm going to distinguish risk factors, things that mm -hmm. predispose you to having a condition uh, yes. as opposed to the cause of the condition. The mm -hmm. major risk factor for fatty liver disease is obesity. And okay. obesity is typically defined as someone with a body mass index greater than 30 or depending on the country, greater than 28. The second most important risk factor is diabetes. So people with diabetes have two times the risk of fatty liver disease. In many diabetes clinic, a full half of everyone with type two diabetes would have fatty liver disease. The third main one is high triglycerides, which is a type of cholesterol or low bad or low good cholesterol, low HDL. The fourth one is hypertension. Okay. Those four conditions, people call them as the metabolic syndrome. They all work by altering the levels of insulin in the body. Mm -hmm. And that is thought to be the main driver for fatty liver disease. All four conditions produce a state of high insulin in the body, which encourages the deposition of fat in the liver. So mm -hmm. it happens, there are some individuals that are more predisposed to it. And now we know that there are several genetic alterations that either increase or decrease an individual risk more than the average to develop this fatty liver disease, and especially to develop the complications related to fatty liver disease. These genetic tests are still not common practice. In other words, you can't just order them uh, because what we know is already sufficient, the diabetes and the obesity and the cholesterol. But it's important to know that, that it does have some genetic underpinnings. Okay. So, doctor, is it possible to prevent uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Is there any yes, way? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It is possible to both prevent it and, and treat it. And uh, the best prevention in all studies, I mean, given the, the strong association and therefore the inverse association between this condition and obesity, maintaining a normal body weight, body index, and a high level of physical activities are mm -hmm. the strongest two factors that their presence is inversely associated with fatty liver disease. Those who maintain this weight and exercise are much less likely to develop fatty liver disease. So there's no question about uh, the role of prevention. And also there's no question that this disease is a, a new phenomenon that coincided with the obesity epidemic uh, yeah. worldwide. I mean, just 20 years ago, uh, it's not something I mentioned in my practice. I mean, it was mostly hepatitis C and alcohol and things like that. And we never talked about fatty liver as an important condition. And doctor, uh, for example, if, if someone is diagnosed with uh, fatty liver, what is the probability of uh, to progress to uh, cirrhosis, for example? 
Yes, that's a, that's a very important and what, condition. And what are the treatments available to? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the answer to this short question is long, so I'm going to break yeah. it into two halves. Um, yes. the, the, the most important question that people ask when you diagnose them. So I go through everything I told you, and then they mm -hmm. told me, so what? I have fat in my liver. W w what's the big deal? Why is this dangerous? Mm -hmm. And this has two elements why it's dangerous. One of them relates to your question that um, fatty liver disease uh, progresses or can progress to a condition called fatty liver steatohepatitis. It's called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So you and your audience remember that I said fatty liver simply means you have more than 5% of your liver converted to fat. That alone does not cause liver damage. <laughs> what causes liver damage is additional inflammation and scarring and that's called NASH. One mm -hmm. in five of people with NAFLD go on to develop NASH. Once you have NASH, one in five progress to develop cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis of the liver is a badly scarred, non-functional liver. Typically, that scenario that I talked about takes 20 to 30 years to develop. And mm -hmm. hence, we do have a big window to prevent those things. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one why it's dangerous because one in five progress to NASH and one in five of NASH progress to cirrhosis over 20 to 30 years. The other reason why it's dangerous, because as I mentioned, it doesn't develop in healthy people. It develops in people who have diabetes, obese, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, so guess what is the biggest reason for death in people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? It's heart attacks and strokes yeah. because you have the entire risk factors for heart attacks and strokes. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why treating it is important to drive down both liver-related mortality and morbidity and non-liver-related mm -hmm. mortality and morbidity. Okay. So, doctor, what are the treatments available out there for uh, okay. liver damage, for example? Uh, so, the, the, uh, maybe at the, the early stage. Let's talk about early stage and then we'll talk about uh, stages uh, that are advanced. Yes. So, for early stage, I want to mention one point which you told me how you detect it. And it's important for the audience because if they go to their physician and say, Hey, I heard El Saraj says do a liver function, and they do the liver function and it's normal, it doesn't mean they don't have fatty liver disease. So, what we recommend for people is those with uh, obesity and diabetes to not be satisfied only with fatty liver disease but to perform imaging of the liver. There is a commonly performed test called FibroScan. It's a type of wave testing like ultrasound, and it actually quantifies the amount of the fat in the liver. And, and that's what we recommend to screen in a primary care. Ask a bunch of questions, obesity, fatty liver, uh, uh, obesity, uh, uh, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And in the presence of these risk factors, do liver enzymes or liver tests, but yeah. importantly, do imaging. Okay, so now- And this should be done, uh, for example, like every year or like every uh, five I, years? Yes, I think it's every year, actually. Every year. Uh, I mean, every couple of years maximum, yes. particularly in the presence of risk factors. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so going to treatment. First, now you detected it. Uh, mm -hmm. Your next job as a physician, if you detected fatty liver, is to say how bad it is. And fortunately, the test that I mentioned, which is FibroScan, and there is a similar test done with MRI called MR elastography. It's essentially an MRI done in a different way, gives mm -hmm. you a score of the scarring of the liver, the fibrosis. Tells you zero if you don't have anything, cirrhosis if you have four. So it tells you after you do those tests, do you have fatty liver and how bad it is? So for those with minimum scarring, low degree of scarring, but steatosis, weight loss, 10% body weight loss 
working with a dietitian typically, increasing physical activity, changing the type of diet can reverse the condition completely within the space of six to 12 months. Wow. Two things to emphasize. Um, first, uh, the, the, the weight loss is, can happen through any type of diet. I know people ask me which type of diet, but the ones that have been tested, fortunately for you and your audience, Mediterranean diet seems yeah. to be one of the important ones. Mm -hmm. But as I tell people, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you lose those 10% right. of your body. Okay. Second, uh, the, 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 as you know from the weight loss issues, is people regain the, weight, the weight. So sustained weight loss is mm -hmm. the important thing. And, and that is a big problem. And that's why I, I, I encourage people not to go on a crash weight loss. This is not the weight loss you want to do before a wedding so you look good in, in a dress yeah. or in a suit. This is more of a true lifestyle change because the condition, as soon as you gain the weight, it's going to come back. So, so and is it necessary to gain also muscles? The muscles, uh, they have a uh, specific uh, positive impact on this also? Yes, absolutely. I think the, the issue with weight losses in general that you lose fat, but you also lose muscle. Yeah. And if you lose muscle, your ability to continue the weight loss drops because you need the muscle uh, to burn uh, food when you eat it later. And mm -hmm. that's why uh, when I mentioned early in my, my answer, it's not just diet, but increased physical activity, activity. to lessen the effect of diet on losing muscle. And eventually, mm -hmm. to maintain weight, building muscle, particularly for those who are middle-aged or, or older, is, is one of the proven methods of keeping the weight off. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for mild disease, uh, weight loss, physical activity, change in the diet, and, and I didn't say what's the change in the diet, is um, high uh, purified sugar is, is one of those major dangerous diets that have been linked with uh, fatty liver, high fructose diets. So basically reducing the amount of carbohydrates, increasing uh, fruits and vegetables and fibers, uh, reducing processed foods. Uh, these are all uh, the diets that are recommended. So, so that's for mild disease. For more severe disease, and what is more severe disease? It's the disease where we have shown that there's scarring in the liver that is not mild. And how did we do this? By doing the test called FibroScan or MR elastography. Still yes. weight loss is central to that. But there is now proliferation of medications that can help people. Of that, there's one medicine that is used uh, it's not FDA approved for it, but everyone uses it, is uh, the semaglutide uh, and the manjaro terizapatide. Those are the two medications that uh, promote weight loss. Uh, okay. They have been shown, uh, the semaglutide, in good randomized control trials that it also helps reversing and stopping the progression of NASH. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one kind of medications. I don't use those lightly. So I don't prescribe them to someone with mild disease because mm -hmm. again, in my mind, I'm asking someone to be on this kind of lifestyle for 20 to 30 years. And it's probably not practical to give them a medicine for 20 to 30 years. Um, there, there is um, a new medicine FDA approved called Remisteron, and it works on thyroid hormone receptors. It just got approved. Um, it is limited use to those with uh, advanced liver disease. And I can tell you there's at least 10 other medications that in the space of the next three to five years uh, would be approved. And I think there's real possibility of multiple medications used, particularly those with advanced liver disease. Just to complete my thought, for those with cirrhosis of the liver, uh, you should refer to a liver specialist because considerations like liver transplant and prevention of complications of liver disease uh, are important. But I really hope for the sake of your audience to, to, to emphasize that 99% of 
don't have this advanced liver cirrhosis and don't lead liver transplant. And the point is to stop them from getting there. Most people can be treated and treated well with weight loss, exercise, and diet. And then you can add the medications for the weight loss uh, to make it better. So it is treatable, uh, but it's difficult because it's chronic and because uh, regaining the weight is something that people occasionally do. So doctor, uh, it's reversible, you mean, if it's at an early stage, it's reversible and you won't see the fat uh, on the liver uh, anymore. It's amazing. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I see it in my clinic so frequently and I show my patients. It yeah. essentially melts. Uh, not only the fat melts, the scarring melts the scarring with the weight melts. loss. So diet and uh, and exercise are the main uh, uh, prevention, if you want to say, for uh, Correct. Fat and, and, you know, not to be judgmental, the, the, the medications for weight loss, like semaglutide, which is yeah. Wagovi, et cetera, uh, mm. are, are becoming mainstay treatment for obesity. And mm. I personally recommend them for those with NASH who come to my clinic. I, I feel like they already progressed. It's not early. And um, I would like to get quick results. And mm. sometimes when they lose this weight, it reinforces that, oh, now I can maintain my weight, et cetera. So there's no taboo against using those medications for a condition like this, in my opinion. Especially if you are overweight, so it's, they are very uh, helpful. If you are overweight, they are very helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. Basically. And if you're diabetic, I mean, they, they're originally diabetes medications. True, true. Yeah. And doctor, can we talk about the, the, the fatty liver disease due to alcohol abuse? So at yes. what stage, for example, how many, how many glasses, for example, of alcohol per day can get you to have fatty liver disease? Or it depends on... On the, on the individual line. Yeah. Of course, it depends on the individuals, but there are many, I mean, alcohol is a, is a, a long uh, standing issue. So there've been so yeah. many studies and so many surveys and people have reached uh, some, some sort of parameters. So mm -hmm. the general rule is first, let's define what is a drink. And I think people get really confused. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a normal glass of wine, a shot, of hard liquor or mm -hmm. a 12 ounce of beer. This is what people define as one drink. Mm -hmm. So contrary to, to popular opinion, um, you know, a shot of whiskey is not worse than a 12 ounce beer. It's all called a drink, okay? Yeah. So for women, and so that's number one, defining what a drink is. Number two, there's difference between men and women. And unfortunately for women, they are much more susceptible to develop mm -hmm. alcohol liver disease um, given the same amount of alcohol. So for okay. women, believe it or not, heavy drinking is more than one drink per day, which is not a lot for many people. For men, it's more than two drinks per day. Um, so again, uh, one can imagine that, you know, if you on the weekend, you go and you drink three or four drinks and then occasionally you drink here and there rapidly, you get yeah. to dangerous levels of alcohol drinking. Uh, mm -hmm. So to repeat, five drinks a week for women, 10 drinks for a week for men is what constitutes uh, heavy alcohol drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'm sorry to reverse back for fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. As I mentioned, it happens that many people actually drink on top of that. So as sure. part of the treatment and the prevention, we advise them uh, to reduce, reduce our cuts, drinking. Uh, that's our exactly cuts. right. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Uh, but that's uh, uh, dangerous alcohol drinking. Or but in level. both ways, they have the same treatments in both ways. Uh, less emphasis on the weight loss for alcoholic liver disease, unless they are already overweight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the emphasis in, in alcoholic liver disease is, is really abstinence. Um, I think it, it's a complicated question. You know, some people um, are not dependent on alcohol and have alcoholic liver disease. Uh, and in that you could say reduce a little bit. Uh, but in my experience, the ones that come especially with advanced alcoholic liver disease have, have real alcohol dependence syndrome. Mm -hmm. And therefore, reducing level of alcohol is not a great way of going about it. It may be the only thing possible, 
but in those I advise uh, real therapy uh, to get off of the alcohol um, and stay off of it, just like the weight loss. It's relatively easy to, to quit for a few months, but it's difficult to quit long-term. So in yeah. those, I would caution you the, the, and the viewers that, that don't take it nonchalant. I mean, we say, oh, don't drink, as if yeah. this is as easy as me saying don't drink or lose weight. I mean, these are real diseases that yeah. led to obesity. Alcohol is becoming also, it's not uh, only the, the ones who abuse alcohol. It's becoming social, uh, you know, when you go out uh, and you don't drink, they will tell you, ah, oh, why you don't drink alcohol, for example? You, you will have to have one glass of something. or So this is uh, the issue also. Uh, you're it's absolutely also right. Uh, but I want to go back to diet. That is also socially acceptable way. I mean, people who do surgery to bariatric surgery, if, if you talk to them, the major disruption that they get is to their social life. Because yeah, everything right. social we go is let's go eat this, let's go out that. So having someone who doesn't want to eat is actually yeah. a, a socially unacceptable behavior. Yeah, it's uh, peer pressure, I think. <laughs> it, it is pressure and it's the way our society evolved i mean most of our social activities revolve around food whether we talk when we food we meet around food etc etc okay. yeah. so doctor one last question what are the symptoms okay, okay we know that we have to do some tests but sometimes people let let themselves go and tell us about the symptoms that one should look for uh, and be yes. uh, be alarmed yes. Yes. Uh, so I want to emphasize again, most people in the early and medium stages have no yes. specific symptoms. True. But okay. when you get to it, uh, the most common early symptom is actually fatigue uh, by people saying, I reach the afternoon and I'm pooped. I wake up okay and I lose my energy. Uh, that's one symptom. The second symptom, uh, losing muscle mass. Uh, mm -hmm. Third symptom, and now we're talking really advanced swelling of the ankles and the feet, then swelling of the belly, then yellowish discoloration of the white of the eye and yellowish discoloration of the skin. Some people present with vomiting blood because they develop something we call varicose veins of the esophagus. Some people develop confusion because they have encephalopathy or liver, because as I mentioned, the liver clears the toxins. So when the liver is not working, toxins are circulating in the blood and they affect the memory and the sleep. Some people present with early personality change and reversal of the sleep uh, cycle. Now come to think of it, with the exception of jaundice, which is the yellow discoloration and perhaps vomiting blood, everything I mentioned is also nonspecific. I mean, yeah, fatigue, it, it could be uh, for another, I don't know, a lack of- Right, uh, so the most specific is jaundice. Unfortunately, yeah. if, if you get jaundice due to these diseases, uh, it's it's typically so, quite, quite late. Quite late, yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you, doctor, for your time. Uh, can you give us uh, a last, uh, I don't know, advice for people out there for uh, yes to, to yes well well first thank you i, I really enjoyed it this morning and uh, uh, my advice is is for people to think that the liver is an important organ that has important diseases that affects life quality and survival uh, mm -hmm. my advice is to tell people that the most common liver disorder that one in three of your audience now have today is called fatty liver disease due to alcohol or non-alcohol. So get checked. And if you get checked and you have it, don't say, I have no symptoms, who cares? That's how it works. You have no symptoms until you develop symptoms. Do something about it. Lose weight, increase your physical activity, reduce your alcohol intake. And uh, that's my advice. Great. Thank you, doctor. It was a pleasure. Likewise.